Hi, my name is Allison. Uh, like Garrett said, we went on a trip out to Arizona this summer in July, uh, 20 of us from the church. Um, and I just wanted to give you guys the general context of the trip because we are going to have a handful of people from the trip come up and share uh, what God had done for them and with them on the trip. So we flew out on a Sunday morning, got to Phoenix, drove about three and a half hours to the uh, American Indian Christian Mission, which is a mission that the church has supported for years on a month-to-month -month basis. They were here for Missions Weekend a couple years ago, if you remember. Uh, but they are a boarding school for children on the Indian Reservation. So there's a couple reservations that they work with. And while we were there, of course, the students weren't there because they were home for the summer. We were able to, in the morning, do small service projects around the campus. So that included raking, moving furniture, cleaning things. Um, somebody sealed a cabin. And then we would have lunch, have a chapel service, and then we would get on a bus to a church called White Mountain Apache Christian Church on the Indian Reservation. And there we would, a few of us would get on a bus, drive around the Indian Reservation and pick up however many kids wanted to get on the bus. The driver uh, would go out and honk the horn and kids would run out, get on the bus, they'd come back to the church and we would have what you would call like a VBS type program. So there was singing, there were crafts, uh, there was a lesson, there was always a meal, and then we had activities with the kids that included like basketball, playing outside, uh, nail painting, bracelet making, necklace making, things like that. Uh, so that was Monday through Thursday. Friday we had a bit of a different day, and then we flew back Saturday. So before our first com person comes up to share, I wanted to bring your attention. Most of the kids that came in today got this little Ziploc bag. So when we were out on the reservation, when we were at the church, we had a bunch of beads, a bunch of string, and we would make necklaces and bracelets for whoever, whatever kids wanted to participate in the activity. I sat down and I made one with a girl that said she wanted to make something shiny for her mom because her mom always asks for something shiny and her dad never gives it to her. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, and it's, you'll see it as people talk, like it's in those small moments. She also shared something very tragic about her life, about the way her dad treats her father. And we're just stringing beads on um, some necklaces. So you'll see those little moments as these people come up to share about uh, what God and Holy Spirit has done throughout the trip. But if you're a kid and you got this, I would encourage you, you get to make two bracelets. So one for yourself to keep, and I'll help you remember to pray for the kids that are out in Arizona. And then one we're going to mail back to the kids in Arizona to let them know that we're thinking of them and praying for them. So, uh, Deb, would you like to come up first? Oh, Rand no, Randy. I, I prayed about this. I made the schedule. This is, yeah. Okay. That's what it is. Good morning. So uh, I've been told at times that I overthink things. So uh, maybe this is a little bit of overthinking. But um, when I go into mission trips, sometimes I, I wonder if uh, the costs uh, outweigh the benefits, right? Like, would it be better for me just to send the money to the mission and maybe do some work for God here locally? Um, so I did a little cost-benefit analysis for you. <laughs> Uh, so some of the costs were uh, obvious, an obvious one would be financial, um, and that was on both us and on the congregation. Um, we paid, uh, we, we kind of split the uh, travel expenses, so the missions team was nice enough to cover some of the travel expenses for us. We just had a kind of a fixed fee um, cost. And then uh, there's sleep. There's a three-hour time difference between here and Arizona. So many of us uh, lost sleep, especially that first night. And then those of us who don't sleep too well, we're light sleepers. Uh, we lost some sleep during that trip. Time, obviously, it was a week of uh, each person's time. And then for some of us, uh, there was a health cost because uh, several in the, in the group came back ill. Um, 
So those were kind of the costs, but I believe the, the benefits uh, greatly outweighed what the costs were. And I wanna share some of those with you. And I, I know some of the people in our team will be sharing some more of those with you. Um, the first was just getting to know and work with uh, members of God's family, uh, getting to know them better, seeing their gifts and talents worked out. And it was great getting to know the people on our team better, uh, but also we met some people from Georgia. Uh, there was a church from Georgia who was also there with us, uh, getting to know, to know them and getting to know and meet the people at AICM, uh, the organization that we were helping. And that's, that's my second benefit is uh, getting to know and understand that organization better. Since we support them uh, as a congregation, just uh, certainly their newsletters, their emails can be helpful, but going there and actually working alongside them, meeting the people that they're trying to help uh, was uh, just a great benefit. The third thing was um, that we went into the week knowing very little about what we were would be doing. We knew uh, a few details, but not much. And so just having experienced uh, the week, uh, we feel like, um, we feel like that, uh, you know, if we, first off, we can provide some feedback to AICM, which I know we did in written form as we left, but we can also, we, I know we've had conversations too about some things, and so we can share those things with, with AICM um, to hopefully improve the process. But also, um, now that we've experienced it, when we, when we return, uh, we can better know what to expect and we can better um, maybe uh, provide some direction in that. The next thing was sharing God's love with people who are living in poverty. Uh, obviously, that was the, the main uh, focus that we had when we went there is to share God's love with the, the Native Americans who are in the area. Um, we heard various rumors about the reasons why they're in poverty, and so, uh, you know, I don't want to perpetuate those, but the fact is that the, the Native Americans are living in such poor conditions and living life, lifestyles that are, are just disheartening. Um, so just being able to share God's love with them uh, was a great experience, even though, you know, Many of us came away from it feeling we we barely planted <laughs> planted some seeds. You know, it was is such little work that we did, um, but still we were able to share God's love with them. And the last thing was uh, that it gave us, or at least me, a better perspective on how uh, so God calls us to to work alongside him. He gives us that privilege to do that, to participate in his plan of salvation. But I came away from the trip feeling like we, we just do so little compared to what his Holy Spirit does in working in people's lives to try to change them, uh, to try to bring them to him. Uh, you know, we read in scriptures about Jesus um, and Luke telling his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. His disciples hadn't planted, they hadn't, you know, tended to the plant, to the uh, the plants that were to be harvested. Jesus said, just said, go and harvest. Um, all that work had already been done uh, before their arrival. So uh, just stories like that uh, came to more, I guess, came to life more for me uh, after the trip and experiencing it. I think next Deb is going to share. My twin. <laughs> Good morning. Um, when I went on the missionary trip um, to AICM, I and most of us didn't know what to expect. My eyes were certainly open when I seen the poverty level in the Appalachian, in the Apache area of White Mountain. Their houses were usually just like two bedrooms and would sometimes house 22 people at a time. We got to go inside one of the homes when we dropped off in this community called Sibicute. Her home contained a living 
area and kitchen, and I'm assuming two bedrooms and a bathroom. The lady's name was Rosie, and she was with her grandson. When Rosie, where Rosie lived, there were about 150 people in the community there, and they would come to her house to pick up the food that we delivered. It seems, too, that the grandmothers were the ones that um, held the glue, were keeping the families together, and were often seen with their grandchildren. To see these living conditions of these people made me realize how blessed we are here. When we went to pick up the kids, on the, uh, uh, to pick up the children on the bus to bring them back to the church, it was quite an experience. Pete, the driver, would honk the horn. The kids would come running out. They'd get on the bus. And some of them were hanging out the windows. <laughs> and, I, and me and Donna were just scared to death that they were going to fly out the windows. <laughs> But none of them did. And once we got back to the church, that's when the kids would hear the story of, from the Bible, have lunch, do crafts, painted nails, face painting, and played in the playground. I had a bond with this little girl named Lydia. And she would come holding this little, I, I don't know if it was her Bible, or just like a little book bag. And on the front of it, it would say, go to Grandma's house. So I felt like special with her. Also, after they heard the Bible study, we would break up into groups with the kids and ask a couple questions about what they had heard. Myself and Donna interacted with two sisters, Jasmine and Camille. They were very interested in the Bible story and knew the memory verse from that day. The interaction from our young adults with these kids was amazing, too. The trust that we had built with these children every day was so special. After spending about one and a half to two hours, and they would board the bus and go home. I know we planted seeds in these children's lives, and my hope is they will remember this and want to have a relationship with Jesus. What I experienced on this trip made me realize there's such a great need in our own country and to be more compassionate towards others that are less fortunate than us. Well, good morning. First, I'd really like to just thank you, our church family, for the prayers and the support that you gave us while we were away. Our travels were safe and relatively smooth, and knowing that you were praying for us and feeling the love from home sure helped us to get through some very difficult times. So some say that serving on a mission trip is, is, is life-changing. And in a lot of ways, I believe that's true. I mean, we as Christ followers serve in many capacities here at church, in our communities, and even in our own families. However, there's something to be said for dedicating a full week, and in some cases a month or even years, to serving God so intently and, and just um, compassionately. Um, we're privileged to see and appreciate what God can do in a hurting community. So John 1, 5 tells us that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Well, we certainly experienced that darkness in the Apache Navajo world. But you know what? We sure experienced the workings of the Holy Spirit and God's grace even more. The first half of our days began with various tasks, like Allison mentioned, that were often energy draining, like raking the debris or standing and painting, mopping floors, cleaning bathrooms, etc. You get the picture. Yet our team worked each day dedicated to being good stewards of our abilities and talents for God's glory. We met a lot of true disciples who were an integral part of AICM, all inspiring us as well as cautioning us about the spiritual warfare we could encounter on the reservation. Our hour-long ride to Fort Apache Reservation gave us time to pray and prepare. The hour-long ride back to the mission in the evening gave us a little time to process. It was heart-wrenching to witness evidence of physical abuse noticed in bruises on some of the kids and hearing the stories that they chose to share. We saw a lot of poverty, like Deb talked about, um, in those small villages. 
Um, but, you know, we also sensed a starvation for love and affection from these kids, often starting with a shyness or a reticence, but evolving into so many smiles, laughter, and lots of hugs. It was heartwarming to see those smiles that for those short hours we spent with the children and some of the adults let us know we were making a difference just by caring. Our teens and 20-somethings inspired me with their sensitive, compassionate, and emotional attachment to the children. So aside from our time with the kids, my personal favorite activity was walking around the property of both AICM and the White Mountain Apache Church, just jotting down encouraging words or short scriptures on rocks along the path, and boldly praying and believing that God was hearing us and his Holy Spirit was changing hearts and lives for Team Jesus. My prayers continued daily, speaking Jesus over the names of those kids and adults whom I met. It sure was a privilege to be just a small part of AICM and this amazing team from NCC. So I would encourage you, if you've ever thought about being on a mission trip, bringing God's word of love and light to broken communities, pray about it, ask questions, and just step out in faith. What's up? Um, I'm going to talk about, like, the bus and all that. The bus was pretty fun. Like, it's so in points. Like, I went with the first day, um, me and a bunch of kids. There was a kid named Marcus. Me and this kid, Marcus, we had to head out the window. And we got Adam to go out the window. Uh, every time Marcus went out the window, Adam had to go out the window. And it was pouring down rain. So the first day, we were just, like, soaking wet the whole time. And the playground was muddy, and there's just a bunch of kids. Um, the bus, most of the days, were pretty fun, like I said. Um, the one day, it was pretty sad. There was a disruptive man on the bus. He walked in. He, was, he had something to drink or ate something wrong. He was scaring the kids. Uh, he was just saying things and yelling. And we were singing. We'd sing on the bus a lot. It was fun, just the whole trip and the experience on the bus. But it was also scary at the same time. She didn't know what was going to happen. It was the first time we really expected something like that to happen. We didn't expect it. It was just like came out of nowhere. Like every day was just a good experience, and then that day just changed the whole mindset. That whole day was different. Like this man, he was just yelling and scaring people. Like I had to stand in the middle of the aisle on the bus to keep the guy away from the kids because kids were crying and just screaming. Um, it wasn't fun for me or the other kids. I didn't know if something bad was going to happen to me. Uh, I just had to kind of do whatever I could to make sure that nothing happened to them. Uh, after that, it was just like it was just like a normal day after that for everyone else. But me, I was kind of just like still running around and just like acting like nothing happened, but something did happen. Happen. And I didn't know what to do about it. I just had to act like everything was fine. And I just made sure the kids were OK. Um, I also met a bunch of other kids there, Marcus, Amari, um, Precious. Those kids were so kind. Some of them painted my nails. Um, I had pink nails, blue nails, and white nails. Um, I kept it on for a week after. It reminded me to pray about them. And if you could, can you pray about those three I just said? Marcus, Amari, and Precious. Can you pray about them for me, please? Um, they were all super kind kids. You can see their personality through what they go through. It's sad what they go through, but they have a big personality. Good morning. Jeff's been talking about the spirit, and I want to talk about how the spirit of God worked through what I'm going to call our young people that went on the trip, since I was one of the older ones. Um, these kids did a phenomenal job, and I want to take a different perspective on this whole trip. I'll start with Kevin. Kevin was the oldest of our young people. 
And he just stepped up and showed leadership, especially to the younger ones that were on the trip. Um, when that disruptive young man ended up at the church, he stepped up and helped, from what I heard, because I was sick that day, he stepped up and kind of kept things under control a little bit with that guy. So that was very much appreciated. Also, at one of our meetings, he wasn't sure how he was going to be able to handle being with younger people. And by the end of that trip, he come home on the airplane with his nails polished. <laughs> um, Lauren. Lauren showed a gentleness with the children, very kind, very soft-spoken, but that's what some of those kids really needed. Uh, she also stepped up, and everybody that goes there, they do a sign as a team. And they leave it, and it gets posted on a post outside on the campus. And she did a started a beautiful sign, and she had everybody put their thumbprint on it that was in our group. Megan. Megan also helped with that sign, and she just did a great job with it also with her sister and the other young people in our group. Also, Megan, she interacted with us older adults. Um, we went down a trail one day, and there were three crosses, and we just sat there and prayed and talked and walked, and it was really nice to get to know her that day. Grace. Grace, her name says it all. She showed grace. There was a little girl that came up, and she had marks on her face. And when I looked, Grace had gotten a cloth, and she was wiping the marks in the cuts, whatever they were, on this little girl's face. And she was very concerned, and she talked to the pastor about it. But she just sat there, and that little girl just sat with her, and she just talked to her and wiped her face. Estelle. Estelle stepped out by getting to know the other people from the other team, the other church that was there. She went to the school with Sarah and her mom, Audrey, and they painted a beautiful tree on the wall. And I mean, she got to use her artistic ability and it was really beautiful. And she left her mark for those kids. So now those kids will remember our team and her. Also, she taught me something. We were in the bathroom, and I said, I love how you do your hair. So she showed me how she braids her hair at night, and the next morning she lets it out, and she has all these beautiful curls, even though mine's not long enough, but I, I really enjoyed talking with her. And then there's Adam. This is the second trip I got to go on with Adam, and I so enjoyed talking with him. I was over by the chapel one morning, just sitting there doing my devotion, and I looked over. There was Adam, there was Eden, and another young man, Wyatt, from the other team. And they were staining the outside of the chapel, and they had a ladder, and I watched Adam. He took charge. He was worried about their safety with that ladder. I don't know if he even realizes he was doing it, but he was telling them how to move the ladder and how to stay safe. And I thought, that was really kind of cool for a young man to take to do that. And then there was Eden, our Eden. Every time I looked at her, she had a kid in her arms. She was just carrying them from the bus or carrying them around the campus. Also, she taught us all how to do a line dance. I think it was called the church clap, and I even got to do it, but it was fun, and she got everybody involved. And then there was Gage, the incident on the bus. I wasn't there that day, but I heard all about it, and I'm so proud of him. Also, he was willing to step up and do anything that was asked of him. He did a skit 
where one little kid just kind of poured ketchup all over his head. <laughs> so I want to say how proud we should all be of these kids. They did, to me, they're kids. They showed the love of God to this group of people and just so proud of them. So, so far, um, you guys have heard from a variety of sources and backgrounds. Uh, I wanted to have Lindsay come up here because I wanted, Lindsay's had the opportunity to go on a few different trips, a couple with the church and a couple or just one, I don't know, with another church. So I wanted her to come up and explain maybe um, how did this trip compare to the other trips they've gone on? Um, I've been able to go to Kentucky twice with you. I've been able to go to the Dominican once. Um, and this in Arizona was the toughest trip by far that I've done. Um, it was tough physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, physically, we had a very packed schedule. You guys kind of described a lot of that already. Um, emotionally, it was really difficult to see the reality on the reservation versus what I had like imagined in my head. And we read about it. You know, we read a research paper. We read like excerpts from other books. We watched a documentary. So like, I was like, oh, I've got this. I know. Um, but getting there and really seeing what was going on, it just, I don't know, it just rips you apart. Um, you know, it was worse than some of the things that I saw in the Dominican. It was worse than some of the, like, what you imagine from a third world country. Um, and on Thursday, um, what Gage was talking about, knowing that the kids were going back, that was our last day that we were working with them, seeing them get on the bus to leave and know that we, you know, weren't going to see them again most likely, or you know, if we go back, there's a chance we might see them, but that's a while from now. You know, we don't know what's gonna happen between now and then. Um, it was just so difficult to see them get on that bus and go back to the things that they were struggling and, and living through. Um, there was one young woman that hid on the bus and wouldn't get off because she wanted to stay with Estelle. She didn't wanna go home. Um, and so our, our as, as Cindy said, our kids, loved on them. Our whole group loved on them in such a deep and genuine way. Um, it was so incredible to experience that. And on the spiritual front, man, there is a darkness and heaviness that many of us could feel. You know, you could just feel it weighing on you. Um, and I hate to use like a Christianese word because I don't even know what it means, but I feel like it encapsulates this. But like there is a spiritual stronghold there that I've never experienced before. Um, it's like a spiritual force that keeps people trapped in darkness, you know, where they are hurting themselves and they're hurting others. Um, and it just, it's so hard to see something like that, you know, blocking God's unconditional love, his healing, his grace, and his mercy. Um, but, you know, the darkness can't win. It won't. Um, you know, with AICM and the White Mountain Apache Christian Church, um, and groups, you know, bringing love and bringing Jesus. Um, it's only a matter of time, you know, before the light really breaks through. And I don't know, I love this picture so much because I feel like it represents the trip. Like, you know, there's darkness, but you can see the light coming through. Just love that. Um, so I like, I agree about the spiritual darkness was more palpable. And I think um, we, I always... Like um, some of the first meetings of the trip, I always tell people to lower your expectations. And surprisingly, people still want to go on the trip after I say that. But I think we, we have defined that to be to release your expectations. Mm -hmm. Because, and I had to do it myself, and I did not want to, even though I knew I should have. But like Lindsay said, we had to, like, we made sure we were reading about the culture. We didn't want to go in there and just be a bunch of idiotic white Americans, honestly. So uh, we're trying to be mindful of the people that have done ministry there for years um, and submit to them and know, like, the culture and try and understand the history. Uh, and I feel like God is like, bless your heart when you try and do that stuff, because he... Every trip, he blows it out of the water. He's like, I am working there, and I'm doing great things. And it's not going to be what you expect, but it's going to be better. Um, so that that's a good place to be, I think, sometimes. It's a scary place to be. 
to be really like, okay, I have to release, you know, what I expect is going to happen. Um, but God always honors that, and it's better than what we can expect. So with that, how did um, God work out some of the details that you were unsure of? Yeah. yeah, I was unsure about working with the little kids because um, I've worked with teenagers and young adults for so long. And I don't know, like, I mean, I had four kids. I like kids. They're great. <laughs> but, like, I don't know. It's just it's different, and that's not my thing, I guess, as much as it is other people's. Like, other people are much better at it, is, is what I'm saying. Um, so I was, I was concerned about, you know, is this really the trip that I should be on? Um, but God allowed me to serve in, in different ways. Um, Ed Boone and I found some of the middle school and high school students, you know, for the small discussion questions after the lessons. Um, and then I was engaged in a conversation with another member of White Mountain Apache Church, and she invited me to come in and visit and, like, share with her sobriety group that meets with her at the church once a week. Um, and her study topic for that session was how our earthly fathers, good or bad, um, can affect how we see and relate with our heavenly father. Um, her name, Isabel. Um, Isabel and I shared parts of our testimonies and focused on God's patience, his love and grace with us as we sort through his identity compared to our earthly fathers. We focused on the way our earthly fathers saw us and, and the baggage that we carry from that um, and, and recognizing that that's not how our heavenly father sees us. Um, it was such a beautiful opportunity, and I plan on keeping in touch with Isabel um, to continue to pray over the women in her group. Um, some of them shared about their battles, you know, with sobriety and with getting their children back because their children have been taken away or in, or in somebody else's custody. Um, one woman, and it, it touched me so deeply, her concern about, you know, Christianity was just like, I can't wrap my mind around a person who was God but who would be humble enough to die. And so, like, I've been working on that and trying to think about, you know, how to correspond with her and just to continue walking through Scripture with her because, I don't know, it, it is hard to imagine, you know, what Jesus did for us. Um, and I just feel it heavy on my heart to continue to continue that conversation. Um, I never expected to be able to participate in that way. And then God blessed us with some other relationships that were just incredible. Um, there was a beautiful Navajo woman who was a former student at AICM. Um, she returned to help the school reach out to the First Nations and support AICM's efforts. Um, for our week, she led the prayer groups. Um, and you know, she and I have continued to pray. I know you've been in touch with her a lot, too. Um, we're scheming maybe to get together at, at ICOM, which I'm really excited about, um, uh, which is the International Conference on Mission. I'm sorry. I'm using all these AICM, WAMCC, or blah, whatever. Um, so, but that it just, I can't thank God enough for meeting Nesba and um, getting to participate with her in prayer um, to see her love for God and her openness to the Holy Spirit. Um, and God also showed us that the mission trips aren't solely about ministering to the people there, um, like on the, on the reservation, but also ministering to the people who work at AICM long term. Um, our young adults were really able to draw close to the Cooper family who, um, you know, their dad is the, the director of operations. I knew he directed operations. Um, <laughs> But they got really close to them. Um, and their family, you know, being there, I feel like in some ways they're isolated and they don't get the interaction that, you know, a lot of young people need um, or they may not. I don't know that for sure. Um, but they, we were really able to draw close to them. Emma Jean, who is 20, um, she ran the kitchen. I was able to spend a decent amount of time serving with her in there. Um, and on Friday, there were two different opportunities. We could go to CBQ and deliver meals. Um, or we could go to Box Canyon with uh, the Cooper family. Um, and I really wanted to go, I wanted to go deliver meals, but they needed another driver to, to go to Box Canyon. And so it was one of those things where release your expectations, just, you know, show up and let God do what he wants to do. So I trusted God with that, and I went. Um, and so after, you know, it was a difficult week, um, I was able to go, and Box Canyon was like a three-quarter mile hike down to the bottom of a canyon, um, and there were just pools that cascaded into other pools that cascaded. It was 
so beautiful. And so being able to hike um, and, and swim and climb, um, it was such a powerful recharge for me. And I was able to spend time bonding with Emma Jean um, and climbing with her and rock jumping. Um, and no, mom, if you're listening, they weren't too high and the water was deep enough because I know I'll hear about it later. Um, it was so lovely. And to see my other kids and the young, other young adults like playing, not that they play, but they were playing um, you know, with Angelina and Cyrus and Oliver and Titus and, and the other children. Um, it was just so incredible. It, it, I really needed that at the end of the week. Um, you know, so we were able to serve alongside them and serve them you know, as they pour their lives into the mission. Um, Zach, the, the dad, the director, um, commented to me on Saturday morning before we left how much their family loved just our whole group. Um, and Emma Jean has been conspiring with Eden and Estelle. She's going to come and visit us over Christmas break when she comes to the East Coast to visit friends in Florida. And so I, as I was thinking about this, you know, when I read Paul's letter to the churches now, his letters, I really feel his longing and his love for his fellow servants in Christ. You know, sometimes we skip over those lists at the end, you know, and, but man, I feel it now. I hear the love in his voice. My heart aches to spend more time with so many of the people that I've met over the last several years on the different trips. Um, we can learn so much from others in, in other cultures and parts of the world, and we always have, like, an immediate connection in Christ. Um, it's, it's really supernatural. Thanks. So. You know, I agree. The supernatural um, was more evident on this trip in good ways and in scary ways. So if you look at this, this is our group. We had 20 people go. The names are on the back of your bulletin. The extra faces you see are the kids that um, went to Box Canyon, and they work on, on AICM um, tirelessly with their family. So it was, like Lindsay said, it was a really great opportunity to go there and be able to encourage them. That's something that, like, you can't advertise that on a trip sometimes because people want to hear, oh, let's, we're going to build a church, we're going to do VBS, we're going to do this. But I know God's going to do things like this too, where he sees lonely teenagers that need some other teenagers to come and play night square with them and encourage them on their birthdays, which was awesome too. Um, so I think Gage, like you mentioned this too, Gage doesn't give himself and God enough credit for that Thursday on the bus a lot of what we experienced kind of came to a head that day. What Christy was supposed to share, but unfortunately she's home ill. Um, she was going to lead with some of our crew uh, VBS lesson on the gospel of Jesus Christ, plain and simple. This is what she was thinking that the Lord was telling her to do. And we had so many roadblocks come up um, that looking at the end of the day, we had no choice but to say this was something spiritual going on. Um, and it changed our outlook on the way we pray and the way we approach God. I think we had physical things, like that gentleman on the bus. Um, thankfully, Gage was there to kind of protect the kids. Uh, we, the kids got, kids got off the bus to come in to, for a VBS lesson. That guy was still yelling. A dog got hit by a car. Uh, there was a lot of disorder and chaos. But it all came together, and at the end of the day, the kids were walking around with glow sticks on their neck that said Team Jesus because that had to do with the lesson. And it's just, it was like a physical reminder of like, yes, at the end of the day, Jesus is here and he is what is going to redeem these children. And maybe some of them are just like, yeah, I have a glow stick. But it was, I think, very interesting to see like the name of Jesus on their necks. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to say and now it's leaving me. Oh, so Jeff's looking at me. Doesn't mean I need to go faster. So the thing, this is, he'll sum it up. But the point is, like, so we're experiencing all these things on the trip. God is doing amazing things. Unfortunately, some of us are getting sick, but we're praying through it. We're getting through it. Um, we're relying more on God's strength and Holy Spirit. We're having these deep conversations about the Holy Spirit and what he's doing and what it can look like and how it's different than we expected or imagined. And... Um, really wrestling with what that means and with our own identities and all that stuff. And then we come home, we get home late Saturday night, drag, literally, I don't want to say drag ourselves to church because church is awesome, but I was tired. And Jeff's preaching about the Holy Spirit. I'm just like, mm, this, is a bit, <laughs> this is a bit too much. Um, yeah, discernment. And so it was a blessing to be able to come home 
and see God kind of um, confirm the things that we had experienced on the trip. Yeah, weaving it together, that's a good way to put it, because I think um, he is doing what he did out in Arizona. He's doing that here with this congregation. And we knew the whole time that you guys are praying for us, and that was a big deal. Do not discount that. I think the trip could have been a lot different if you guys were not back here praying. Um, so thank you very much, and I hope that you would consider going on a trip next year. So we will be going back to Arizona. All right. Thank you all for sharing and uh, just giving us a bit of a picture. Uh, talking about the Spirit, and so many did in their testimonies of the trip, I just want to wrap up with the saying that the Holy Spirit sends. Since the introduction of the Spirit by Jesus in the book of Acts, he says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Not the first introduction, we see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, But you will receive power, and the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so here our mission team went to really what seems the end of the earth. It was a little bit closer to home than we realized, but in some of those pictures, man, it seems like the end of the earth and the poverty that they saw there. And the Holy Spirit sent them. At some point, each one of those individuals that went on the mission trip had the prompting of the Holy Spirit, whether it was through an announcement that happened on a Sunday morning and they thought, man, maybe that's me, uh, through a personal conversation with someone else, through family members sitting together at a di dinner table talking about going on the mission trip together. One more passage, Acts chapter 13. Uh, this is talking about the early church and some, some leaders there. It says, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. The Holy Spirit sends. It's so interesting that this was such a clear picture that these two individuals had to go, that the Holy Spirit was saying, go. And maybe the Holy Spirit in some way is telling you to go. Uh, maybe not to Arizona. Maybe we'll have a mission trip there next summer as well. Uh, but maybe it's just to go to that coworker. Maybe it's just to go to that uh, person at the empty lunch table across the cafeteria. Uh, I don't know where the Holy Spirit is sending you. And that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's telling you something different than, the, than he's telling me. Uh, but the Holy Spirit sends. It's part of what the Holy Spirit does. And part of our growth process here at NCC is to come, connect, grow, and go. Uh, we become stagnant and unhealthy when we don't go, uh, when we, it's just about ourselves. And so the Holy Spirit in some way is sending you because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Let me pray for you, and then we'll continue to praise God together through song. Dear Lord, I thank